morning, everybody. Hi. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Laura Pagorni. I, one of the ways I help out around here is I head up the uh, coffee team. So complaints, compliments, bring them all here. New sign-ups, see me. Uh, uh, oh, hello, everyone online. Did want to forget you guys. Uh, welcome, everybody. Glad you're all here spending some time with us today. So it's our hope here at Crossroads. Everyone would feel connected in one way or another, and I've got a few announcements to, uh, to help you with that. Uh, so, oh, gosh, okay, buckle up. We got a lot of Christmas stuff going on, okay? And everything is in your bulletin, so just kind of like, what did she say about whatever? You can just circle that back, and I'll be here um, out at the welcome area after the service, and you can come talk to me if you need a clarification on anything. Ben, just walked in the door, right on cue. Thank you. I'm starting announcements, and we're starting with you guys. We've got the uh, carol crawl tonight at 6 p.m. Not too late to join in the fun. Pastor Ben, right there at the door, if you have any... Uh, Teenagers that might be interested in that, they're going to be caroling house to house, but in a fun way. You can see him to join up for that. Also, the youth are going to be doing their annual Maltese manhunt, which is a really fun event where the uh, youth, if they choose to accept the assignment, they go over to the uh, 12 Oaks Mall and try to find the costumed leaders of the church, and it's always a good time. So that'll be Friday, the 16th at 545. You can see Ben about that as well if uh, your kid wants to participate in that. And then, am I going too fast? No? Okay, all right. <laughs> like, raise your hand if I need to slow down, right? Because I can talk pretty fast. Also, next Sunday, after the service, now we're gonna move on to the kids, they're gonna have a um, Christmas parade, but everyone's invited for that. We're gonna go to South Lion Rehab over on Sweet Reynolds Parkway. So it's gonna be outside the, the building, just wear your festive you know, holiday clothes, maybe make a sign, we're going to be parading outside the perimeter of the building for all the uh, residents to look outside their windows and we can spread Christmas cheer. So have your Christmas files on for that. So we've done this um, in the past and it's always been a fun family event. So we encourage everyone to do that. That'll be right after the service on Sunday next week. And then also next Sunday, because <clears throat> you could go do that and then come back <laughs> because you like filling your days for a cookie exchange that'll be at two o'clock it really is just for the ladies but if there's any guys that really really want to go uh, you, know, you can let us know right <laughs> so that would be you make five dozen cookies you bring it to the exchange a lot of festivities going on and then you would go home with five different dozen cookies so that that's a cool thing to do then the men and women's group so we're covering everything here you got it you got youth you got the kids you got everybody the men's and the women's group are um, combining on the 20th for a fellowship potluck dinner. So that'll be at six o'clock, um, sorry, my bad, 6.30. So that'll be here at the church and that'll be on the 20th. So all are invited. You don't have to be participating in the fellowship groups that meet weekly. This is just a way for everyone to uh, be in community with each other and to meet some new people. So 20th at 6.30. All right, Christmas Eve, who's ready for that? Oh, everyone, yay, right? As always, we have two services. It'll be 5.30 and 7 o'clock. No child care. It'll be kid-friendly services. So have your kids come with you. Guess what? You can wear your pajamas. Kids, kids, you can wear your pajamas. Okay. Although, you know, I love those families that have their matching outfits. That would be really cool to see. I can think of a couple families in mind that might do that, uh, <laughs> which would be a whole lot of fun. And we're going to have busy bags available for the kids, so they'll be here in the service. So that's Christmas Eve. That's Saturday, 5.30 and 7. Christmas Day, there will be a service. But because it's only one service, we still wanted to have a sleep-in Sunday. So we're going to make it 11 o'clock instead of 10. Right? Yay, right? But you got to get out of your pajamas. you got to come in clothes, right? So that, that'll be different. So sleep-in Sunday for Christmas Day and also... Uh, New Year's Day. And you know what? I, forgive me. Let's do, can we just rewind this and back up? I made a mistake. I'm sorry. It's Christmas Day that the kids wear their pajamas. Forgive me. Christmas Eve, it's just all dress up clothes. So Christmas Eve um, is regular. Christmas Day is when the kids come in their pajamas. And I do have it right in the bulletin. Sorry. All right. So Christmas Day, New Year's Day is um, the 11 o'clock sleep and service days. This is a lot of announcements. I think I, whew, <laughs> I think I went over, right? All right. So Beyond all that, again, it is our hope everyone would be, can feel that they can be connected. A lot of ways to do that. We've got the website, uh, the app, the Facebook page, certainly the bulletin, the welcome table afterwards. You can see me. Um, uh, I did say email. Yep. So at that point, 
again, our heads are all swimming with all this information, right? So feel free to talk to me after and help straighten me out if I made a mistake on anything. So right now, if you wouldn't mind standing up and we're gonna prepare our hearts with uh, the band here for our call to worship. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. All right, let's get our hearts ready. You guys read the big bold words. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. Come, O oh Lord, and, and send, send us, us your light. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Come and bring the light of God. Come and walk among us. Be our savior and our friend. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Come to bring us your peace. Amen. Amen. All right, so we've got a new song for you. Um, if you are comfortable singing along with the verses, feel free, but otherwise you can join in when the ensemble joins in too. <laughs> be seated. Good morning. I'm Dave. I'm uh, one of the pastors here. In case you don't know that, we're online. Uh, it's a time in our service where we do a few things. We take an offering, um, which we're going to uh, do in the room here. And for if you haven't been around since we did this, basically Laura is going to be giving each section a basket in the front, and you just keep passing it back to the back of your section. And that's how it works. So you just take them all. You can take them all. You can handle it. 
Uh, if you're online, you can give by going to the website. There's a place on there to give, or you can mail in something and check. We still have the box in the back. If you like putting something in the box back there, too, that's also fine. So one of the other things we do at Offering is we look at a scripture and that kind of focuses our hearts on giving. And uh, we're looking here at Romans 12. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is true worship. And like we say around here at Crossroads, you know, giving isn't just about financial. It includes that, but it's so many ways. It's your time, your talent, your treasure, your story, your testimony. And so there's so many ways we can be that living sacrifice and uh, we can offer ourselves in that way. And there's a couple opportunities coming up. Uh, so City Covenant, which is our sister church down in the Brightmoor section in Detroit, are looking for uh, getting gloves and scarves and, uh, and hats. Uh, and there is a basket, if you're interested in giving of those, it's out, I think it's still out in the hallway, right? It was out there earlier, like near the door. And uh, you can come and bring, bring those in or bring those in during the week. Uh, and um, it's, overflowing. it's overflowing. So you've already been bringing it in. So awesome. Yeah, and keep it coming. And the other opportunity, which is really big uh, here and helps out so many people, is this is our gift card drive. So you're basically getting a gift card, bringing it in. And uh, those, you know, those will last, like, I think they lasted through the whole year last year, right, Joe? Um, Yeah, he said we just got rid of, we were just able to bless somebody with one. <laughs> uh, but these, <laughs> Angela, Uber cards, yeah, those can, those, those are fine. But somebody might still use them too if we had them, right? So, okay, I got overrode by the co-pastor. Said no. So, <laughs> but um, but really, uh, uh, you know, there's a question mark card there. Maybe that's gas. Gas cards are really, especially with gas prices, how they fluctuate and go way up. Um, those would be really helpful too. And these really really help people. Uh, that are in a bind and in a pinch and don't know where they're going to get their next meal for the week, you know, and they can get a card from the church, you know, and go do that. That's awesome. So really appreciate everybody to do that. So I'm going to, um, before we dismiss the kids, I'm going to say a prayer. And whatever's on our hearts, you probably have people on your minds and on your hearts. Maybe it's a need you have, and we'll lift those all up uh, collectively. And also... If you didn't get a uh, communion cup when you came in, you can just, uh, after the prayer, raise your hand and Linda will make sure you get one. So Father God, we just come to you right now and um, we're just so grateful that you, we can come to you and bring our needs and our requests. And there are those on our hearts that were, you know them all as we lift them up to you. And we pray that you will meet those needs, that you will touch lives, that you will bring encouragement, hope, help, financial help, whatever it is, Lord, that you will pour out your blessings from heaven and meet those needs and touch those people that, we're, that are in our mind's eye and that are here in the room. And we just thank you for doing that, and we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. So, yeah, if you need a communion cup and then kids... You can go back with uh, Miss Shannon. Looks like she's got a good craft going for you. So, and the rest of us, uh, let's stand up and continue to worship. All right. So we've got a familiar Christmas carol here, but we have changed it up a tiny bit. So how many of you know Little Drummer Boy? Yes. Uh, you're not going to be singing any Parumpa Pum Pums today. So I'm really sorry if you love those. Not today. You can go play it in the car on the way home. So instead of the Parumpa Pum Pums, the ensemble is going to be singing some hallelujahs, but you can sing along with me and then stop if you want, or you can kind of catch up what they're doing and sing with them. But before we sing the song, I wanted to just share, uh, you know, the last couple of years I've really grown to appreciate the lyrics in this song. As a kid, I just kind of sang them because it was fun to sing Parumpa Pum Pum, and I'm taking that joy away from you today. <laughs> but, you know, this, this song, it's just... 
the, the beauty of it is the simplicity of it is just, you know, what, this little boy had nothing to give him except for playing his drum. And for us, sometimes, you know, you can feel stripped away like you've got nothing to give him, but you can give him your gratitude, your hallelujah. And hallelujah is just saying, I praise you, God, for who you are in my life. And that is what the song Gratitude sings about. It sings, all that I have is a hallelujah. And I thought those two songs fit together really, really well. So I had to change the song up a little bit. That's why I had to take out the parumpa pum pums So don't sing them. <laughs>
Amen. take a seat. All right, we're going to move into our time of prayer. And I I wanted to share a little something with you before we go there. So a couple weeks back, um, I was struggling with some anger issues. I had some stuff going on in my life that was just making me mad. And, you know, not that there might not be anything wrong with anger. I know you can use it constructively, but it was kind of just getting at me and I could feel it. And there was this one morning I was reading in my Bible and I don't usually read, read my Bible and have music playing in my ears at the same time, but I did this time. And I'll tell you why it makes 
sense later, but um, I wanted to read to you from Psalm 137 first before I share that. All right, so it says, Whenever I walk into trouble, you are there to bring me. You hold out your hand to protect me against the wrath of my enemies and hold me with your right hand. And I just picture, you know, the God of the universe who has made this entire world, who has placed the stars in the sky, he's formed the seas, and he has fought battles that he has won, and he has parted seas for Moses and let the people walk through and go to the promised land. That hand, you know, it says that one hand, it was like, I just picture him going like this, like, okay, Jen, I'm going to hold this stuff at bay for you. And then he takes me with his right hand and he walks and he guides me. And that hand, the picture of the hand was just, I think that carried me through that whole week ahead when I just felt like there were things that were just pummeling at me, you know, and, and I just pictured his hand. But when I read that verse, in my ears, the exact same time I read that word hand was the song Egypt. And it said, you, you take me out of Egypt, you take me by my hand. And so I just, I don't know if there's any of you in this room that has at times struggled with some anger or whatever it is, right? You have got a God who's just, he's holding back enough of that for you and holding you with his right hand and guiding you. And I just don't want us to ever forget that he's walking with us, whatever we're going through in this Christmas season. So let's just take some time right now and I want all of us together to read the words that are on the screen from Psalm. My strong hand will stay with him and sustain him, regardless of trial or foe. My mighty arm will be his strength and shield. That was written for David, who's going to be, I don't know if he was going into battle or whatever it was that was going to be happening, but that was God speaking about David. So let's read that together one more time. My strong hand will stay with him and sustain him, Regardless of trial or foe, my mighty arm will be his strength and shield. And then the next verse, let's read together from Isaiah. So don't be afraid. I am here with you. Don't be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, help you. I am here with my right hand to make right and hold you up. So let's just close our eyes and let's just take a minute and let's just acknowledge to God those things that maybe are pulling us away from him and I just, I pray that you could feel his hand just holding yours and guiding you back. So picture his hand, whatever it is that you need in life to let him guide you. sing together. You stepped into my Egypt. You took me by the hand. You marched me out in freedom into the promised land. Now I will not forget you, God. I'll sing of all you've done. Death is swallowed up into my Egypt and you took me by the hand and you marched me out in freedom into the promised land now I will not forget you God I'll sing of all you've done death is swallowed up forever by the fury
You're the God who fights for me, Lord of every victory. So this is a time uh, as we prepare our hearts for the Lord's table for communion, which we will take all together at one time. Uh, and if still, if you need any, they are in the back, right behind the back row, if somebody still doesn't have one. Uh, but this is a time of confession. And it's a time uh, to confess those things, those places in our lives, in our hearts, where we've, we've missed it. You know, we've missed it with God. We've missed it with loving God and loving people. And that's what God longs for us to do, is to come to him and confess those things uh, because he longs to connect with us and to bring forgiveness into those places. And so we will take a little bit of time uh, to do that. I will, I'll say a prayer, and then I'll just give us a little time to let God speak to your hearts however he wants to speak. So we pray with me? Father God, we... We just come to you right now so grateful that we have your son who cleanses us as we are ready to celebrate that in this meal that cleanses us and makes a way that when we come to confess our sins that you're righteous and just and you forgive us all of our sins and so in our time of silence in our hearts we lift those up to you we ask for your forgiveness. Lord, we thank you that we simply we simply ask and come to you and you forgive. And now I pray that you will have your blessing on the bread and on the cup that will fill us up, that it will be our daily bread coming to us and filling our souls. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. It's also a time when we profess, we confess and we profess uh, that Jesus Christ is fully man, fully God. He's Lord when we come to the table. And there may be people in the room or online who said, you know, I'm not really at a place where I'm ready to profess that. Um, that's okay. Just really glad you're on the journey. Uh, and because we're not going to ask you to profess something you're not ready to do. But if maybe you're thinking like, well, you know, I think maybe today I am for the first time. Um, this is a great way to come to God in, at the communion table. And if you do that in the room and it's the first time, you know, see me or Pastor Joe afterwards. Or if you're online, please let us know that. Give us a connection at ecrossroads.net and let us know you've done that. We want to reach out to you and help you in that journey. And so we think about communion. We think about that Jesus, that night Jesus was celebrating Passover with his disciples. And as part of Passover, there was bread, there was the cup. Um, and as he took a piece of bread uh, and he broke it, he said to his disciples, this is my body given for you. Take and eat all of it. Let's eat together. And then he took a cup, said, this is a cup in my blood shed for you, shed for all. Let's drink together. pray with me one more time Father God just thank you thank you for the celebration of your incredible sacrifice 
And Lord, we just pray that as we look into your word now, that you will give us those spiritual eyes to see and ears to hear what your word has to say, that you'll work through and speak through this broken vessel, that your glory will shine. And we just thank you and we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, so we've been um, continuing on the, kind of a big series. Oh, uh, sixth through ninth grade, Ben's in the back. He just made his grand entrance. <laughs> as grand as Ben gets, right? Just, uh, we've been going through this kind of a bigger series, really looking at the kingdom of God and then breaking that down into sort of sub-series uh, and looking at the kingdom of God from different, you know, avenues, different perspectives, and thank you, Angela, uh, and so coming up to Christmas time, we've been looking at the kingdom of God, speaking through the angels to the people who were, you know, involved with the, the coming of Christ to the world, and so we've been looking at this idea of listening to the angels, you know, for the call, for the hope, and if you missed any of those, you know, go to our website, ecrossroads.net, click on Worship online, and that will bring down the series. You can catch up on that. So today we're looking at listen to the angels for the plan, for the plan. And when you think about a well-crafted, well-put-together, well-orchestrated, well-implemented plan, who comes to your mind? You don't have to tell me because I know who comes to your mind. <laughs> it's, of course, Indiana Jones, right? I got it right again, didn't I? Yep. I don't know, it's just, it's a gift, but, uh, or it's something. Uh, but, <laughs> but so there was a scene in, you know, uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark where uh, they're hiding, you know, Indiana and his friends, and they put the ark on this truck, and they're like, oh, no, what are we going to do? And they're asking him, and he says this line, and see who can fill in any of the blanks. I don't know, I'm, anybody got it? She's pointing at Mark. I'm making, I'm here, and I'm making it up. I'm making it up as I go. <laughs> and uh, when we think about the plan of God, it, God isn't making it up as he goes, thank God. You know, and that becomes the, the genre for so many of those movies, right? The hero always comes off the cuff and has this improvised plan that always works perfectly. But, but we know it doesn't work that way in real life. You need to have a plan, and the plan of God started at the foundations of the world. And it's a plan that nothing can thwart, nothing spiritually, nothing human, nobody, no enemy, nothing can thwart the plan of God from being carried out. It's going to happen. And so as we look at that, we're going to be looking at how the angel came to Joseph. And I know a lot of us know the story, but quick recap, Joseph, a young Jewish man, he's married to Mary. And married back then, of course, was this kind of process of betrothal, and there was monies exchanged. The whole community, you know, in, in his area would have been involved. And there was a time where they didn't come together intimately yet. Um, that happened later. And so they weren't at that intimate part. They had no intimate relationships. And so Mary, of course, turns up pregnant, which in an honor and shame culture, that would have been, like, huge a huge thing. And so you can only imagine the young Jewish man like Joseph being, what do I do? I just being so freaked out. And so that's where we pick up our story in Matthew. It goes like this. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, and here's that part before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not, be, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son. You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins." And this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not, didn't come together, 
until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. So the plan. He brings the plan, and in this plan, whoops, sorry about that. In this plan, he says, he will save his people from their sin. That's the plan. He will save his people from their sin. And we see that thread all throughout Scripture. Uh, just a few examples. Here we see the angels say it. We hear Jesus, who calls himself the Son of Man sometimes, says the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost, the lost in sin. Paul says, here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I'm the worst, Paul says. And when we think about this, and you hear me say this probably every time I'm up here, is that that's relational. That's relational. It isn't like, oh, you're, you know, you have this sin, and, you know, I just want to punish it, or, or, or I could, but it's, sin is a barrier. God wants us to have this intimate relationship with him, and sin gets in the way. We can't clean ourselves up. We don't have the capability. We need a Savior, and that's what Jesus Christ came to do, is to clean us up in sin so we can have this beautiful, intimate relationship with the Holy God. And that's, that's the plan, and we see that throughout Scripture. And so, as we look at this story with Joseph and the angel, we want to look at the lessons that we can learn from that story. And so we're going to look at uh, how God's plan is reliable. We're going to look at how God's plan is righteous. And we're going to look at how God's plan is discipling. And you can decide if that's a real word or not. <laughs> it's not a typo of <laughs> disciplining. Okay? So this idea that God's plan is reliable. We see here that the angel says to Joseph, do not fear to take Mary home as your wife. That's part of the plan. Sound, I can't imagine how crazy this was for Joseph and how scared he must have been because this could have taken you know, him down, his reputation, I mean, so many things. And he says, don't be afraid because that's the plan. And he's hearing this plan from the angel. Where do we hear the plan from? Well, we hear the plan from Scripture. We hear the plan from the Scriptures. And, you know, we see this idea of the Scriptures telling us and Jesus' words telling us that this is something we can come back to. The Scriptures are something, a reliable messenger of the plan that we can look at as a foundation and keep coming back to when we get scared like Joseph. Do not fear. We've got something solid. And Jesus, we see this in his teaching. At one point, he's talking to the Pharisees, this religious guys, right? And he says this to them. You diligently study the scriptures because you think by them you'll possess eternal life. But these are the scriptures that talk about me. I'm in the plan. I'm in these. And then, when Jesus died and resurrected, you know, he didn't, like, resurrect and ascend right into heaven. He walked around the earth for quite a while. We don't know exactly how long. It could have been weeks, maybe months of time before he ascended into heaven. And he showed himself to hundreds of people. And so when he first resurrected, and he was first starting to show himself, you know, there was a couple of people walking down the road, and they don't recognize him, and he starts to tell them about the Messiah and the scriptures. And then they finally realize, wow, that, it's Jesus. And they go and tell the other 11 apostles who had followed Jesus for three years, who are in a locked room and they're freaking out. And they're like, we saw the resurrected Christ. And then all of a sudden, <clears throat> Jesus himself walks into the room. And he could have just said, look, here I am, resurrected, done deal. Go be the church. That's all you need, right? <laughs> it's all the evidence you need. But this is what he does. He says, then he said, said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms, that's the scripture, must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. 
And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sin is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. He takes the time to do a Bible study. Why? Because those guys knew that's what they had heard. That's what they grew up with was the hearing the scriptures in the synagogue. And that was something they knew. This is what you rely on. And Jesus said, yeah, and those scriptures talk about me. So this is reliable. This is giving you the plan and you can count on it. But then the question comes up, are the scriptures reliable? Are these reliable ancient documents? There's a lot of, not a lot, there's a few very loud voices sometimes that are, you know, doing podcasts, writing books, and saying, you cannot trust this as an ancient document. It's full of all kinds of mistakes and errors, and there's people that say they wrote it that didn't write it, and there was this big gap between the time, you know, things happened and it was actually written down, and there's all these problems. You can't trust this. And that can bring fear. Uh-oh, like Joseph, right? I could be afraid because what if, what if something's wrong and, and the scriptures aren't telling me the truth about the plan? One scholar says, no other historical book has more evidence of reliability than the New Testament documents. It's surprising how many people don't know this. Matter of fact, lots of people have no clue how ancient history is authenticated. There's a scrutiny, there's a criteria that any ancient document has to go through to say, yes, that's historical, that's reliable. And every time the Bible, which has been through that scrutiny many, many times over hundreds of years, always comes out on top as far and above reliable over all the other ancient documents. One uh, scholar, Craig Bloomberg, who wrote a book on this, that, you know, studied this for 40 years, he says this, we can still wholeheartedly believe the Bible in the 21st century, even after honestly engaging contemporary questions. Those questions that people are loudly raising and pointing their fingers to. And he's saying, no. And he also says in that book, like, those voices you hear are very few in number. The majority of scholars know that the, the scriptures are very reliable and authentic ancient documents. But those voices make it seem like, wow, everybody thinks it's not. <laughs> and so if that's, you know, for some of you, you're like, yeah, I know they're reliable. I have no problem with that. For others, if you're going, you know, I kind of struggle. <clears throat> Excuse me, I kind of struggle with that. There are some books. Uh, I'll give you three if you want to take a screenshot or if you don't want to do that, you want to ask me later, I can give you those titles because I don't want to, I could spend the whole <laughs> sermon on this because it's a big topic. But if, if you're struggling with that at all, I'd, I'd encourage you to read those, or there's many others, um, to be able to just go, yeah, yeah, they have, this is reliable. I can count on this. And so. Yeah, why is somebody, uh, Paul asked, why is the research focused on uh, the New Testament? It actually isn't. There actually is uh, research done on the Old Testament as well. Um, and that gets covered in some of these books, too. But the New Testament um, gets, I think, gets more press, gets more coverage. And there's, uh, there's a lot more, because that's the part about talking about Jesus, right? So people are like, oh, well, if that part's wrong, then maybe Jesus, you know. So that, that gets more coverage. But yeah, both, all of that has been put through uh, the same scrutiny. Great question. So another part of this idea of the plan and fear is, you know, when you think about Joseph, you know, as a young man growing up, what did he hear the plan was? What did the 12 disciples that followed Jesus hear that the plan was? And for them, what they grew up hearing is the plan of God is unfolded through a nation. That's how he did it before. He'd raise up Israel to be this great nation, which was supposed to be a light for the world to see. And so now in this time when the angel comes to Joseph, what's going on with the nation? Well, they're taken over by the Roman government. 
And so all the, you know, the, the writings and the rabbis at the time, they're like, the Messiah is going to come and again bring our nation and the plan will work through a nation and we'll, he'll raise up this great nation again and get the shackles of the Roman Empire off our back. He'll raise up an army. He'll go through and become a new government. And that's how the plan will work because that's how God worked before. And so a lot of the, the apostles that were following Jesus were often scared and freaked out because, like, why isn't Jesus raising an army? What's going on? Why isn't he building up our nation? And what they had to learn, what Joseph has to learn, and some of us, even in today, in America have to learn because I, I talk to people and I hear people say, I'm really afraid. I'm really afraid because this nation is going down the tubes and it's going away from God. And I'm scared. And what the angel is saying to Joseph and to the apostles and to us is in what Jesus says is, I will build, no, not my nation, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against us. And so God in that church is a group of people who are in every nation, whether they're a free nation, whether they're not, whether they're an underground church. And, you know, that's how he works. So when our heart gets afraid, and yes, as Americans, we can do our duty to, to vote because that's fine. We have a voice. But the people in the first century had no vote. They had no power. And somehow the church thrived and grew and changed the world. And so when our hearts get scared, let's just remember God works through a church, and that's us. And that plan is reliable. The second lesson we can learn from this is God's plan is righteous. We see this idea that it says Joseph was a just man. That word in the Greek is dikaios, leads righteous. In some English translations say he was a righteous man man. And that word righteousness is kind of a theological term too, and it talks about God's character, that God is righteous. But it also means that when we connect with him, we're supposed to be righteous too. We take on his attribute. The dictionary of a theological terms says righteousness denotes the type of life that ought to characterize Jesus' disciples. So when you think about Joseph, Right? And you think about doing what's right and righteousness. You know, he wanted to follow the law, and really by rights, he could have taken Mary. And I can only imagine, like, we, you know, we think of our modern world with dating and that. It's possible that Mary and Joseph didn't even really know each other very well at this point. And all of a sudden, she comes up pregnant. I can't imagine in the shame and honor culture if he was angry, if he was embarrassed, he could be, you know, divorcing her. There was money that had been spent. There was all this stuff. And by rights, he could have taken her publicly before a group of people and said, yeah, you embarrassed me. You're going to pay for this. I'll humiliate you. And people would have said, that's a righteous man. That's right. Legally, that's right. But is that what Joseph does? No, Joseph shows compassion. He shows the kind of righteousness that Jesus showed. He shows the kind of righteousness we're supposed to have as Christians. We could say, holy moly, we're called holy to live the holy. <laughs> What's so funny about that is I thought I took that slide out. <laughs> <laughs> must be God. It must be a God thing. Because when Joe said that line, he said, Dave is going to do something with that. So I thought I would, and I'm like, nah, I took it out. But the Lord brought it back. I don't know. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Joseph's obedience to the law is not legalistic. He's concerned not only about his own obedience to the law, but also about showing compassion for Mary and having regard for her well-being. He does not abandon his faithfulness to the law in order to care for Mary, nor does he abandon Mary when her condition presents him with a dilemma about his own righteousness. 
Rather, he attempts to balance his obedience with compassion. Man, that's what we're called to do. We can say, I got the right, I am in the right, and I can talk and do whatever I want to people because I'm right in this. And I can treat people and do at anyone's expense. But that's not the righteousness we're called to do in the plan. Many years ago, some of you, uh, you've probably heard this story, A, but uh, knew that, you know, I was at one time married before, divorced, remarried, and I'm married now to Linda for over 27 years. But in, in the first marriage, I was, we were separated a couple times, and in our first separation, my son was young, and we had two cars, and so uh, my wife at the time, she, you know, went to live with her mother-in-law, <clears throat> and she took the car, the new car that we made payments on, and left me with the junker, you know, that leaked oil, and I thought, you know, I'm making the payments on that car. I'm in the right here. I should be driving that car. I have the right to it. Forget that she has my son, you know, and she could break down because I have the right for that. And I remember one time, you know, dropping my son off after a weekend visitation, and I left the junker car there dripping oil in the driveway. Yeah, I'm going to get the in-laws on that one, get them ticked off, and because I'm in the right, and then I'm going to take my car, because I have the right to have it. And even though I felt a little voice saying, no, nah, that's not right, Dave, I did it anyway because of my pride and my anger, and I'm in the right, and I could justify it. And I remember I was talking that night to a couple friends, and one was a brand new Christian, and I was telling them about the car, and the one said, you know, okay, well, yeah, good, you got your car back. And the new Christian, and it was just so innocent, she just said, would Jesus do that? <laughs> I'm like trying to come up with, you know, <laughs> she doesn't know. She's a young Christian. What does she know about this? Because it wasn't. No, Jesus wouldn't do that. No, yes, I had the right, I could say, but that's not how the plan tells us to live out our righteousness. It's thinking about other people. It's compassion. It's love. It's all of that. The Apostle Paul says, you can do a lot of things, and if you don't have love, you're nobody. You're nothing. So the plan is righteous, and we're to carry it out in that way. And thinking about that incident for me, that was very dis discipling. <laughs> and uh, is that really a word? Well, if you go to the 1913 Webster Dictionary, <laughs> they call it a verbal noun. My Greek professor would have freaked out at that verbal noun, but um, discipling was a word. So we can still say it's a word. But I like that idea because we think about being a disciple and we think about discipline. And there are a lot of similarities. So one example is Jesus tells his disciples, I give, a new, I give you a new commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. you. You should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love, have love for one another. Notice he, notice he doesn't say, if you do what you, if you exert your rights, however you want to exert them, however way that looks, everyone will know you're my disciples. <laughs> because what happens when we do that? People go, wow, that's a disciple? I don't want anything to do with that. No, you'll, they'll know you're my disciples by their love. And that's what changed the government in that time, is because Christians started to madly love each other, even their enemies. And that changed the world. But back to this idea of disciples, this Greek word there, mythetes, it's this idea of being a learner, of a disciple. Okay, But then we see the scripture, the, Old, the New Testament, quoting the Old Testament, back to Paul's point, because that's another way those fit together, is, my son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives and daughter. So this idea there, it's a different Greek word under that word, 
but it's still the same connotation. It's this idea of learning, nurturing, instruction. So discipline and disciple, you know, they, they're, they're, they kind of go hand in hand. And as we, as disciples, grow, you know, we're getting disciplined. Because why? Because our Father loves us. And so when we go back to the Joseph story, it says, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. And we don't have an insight into Joseph's inner world, but we can only imagine what kind of growth do you think he had when he obeyed this command? And he said, okay, I'm going to go along that this is the plan. I'm going to cooperate with it. And he got to see things like, you know, the shepherds coming, saying they saw angels, the wise men coming. He got to see when his son growing up at 12 years old is, you know, speaking in the temple with adults. I mean, all the other things he saw. I can only imagine how much he grew spiritually as a, in, in, as a disciple in that moment, uh, in that cooperation with obedience. But what about disobedience? What if you're kind of a bonehead like me, you know, dropping off the car and doing all that stuff? You know, last week, Joe looked at Zechariah, uh, who was a priest who went in and he was, you know, offering incense in the temple. And we read that in Luke. And so, you know, basically, this angel appears to Zechariah and says, look, your prayer's been answered. You've been praying all your life for a son. And it's been answered today. And Zechariah says, ask the angel, how can this be? How can I be sure of this? I'm an old man, and my wife is well along in years. The angel answered, I'm Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you'll be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their proper time. And you could say, yeah, see, God just, you know, send him to the woodshed. You're not going to be able to talk for nine months. Go sit in the chair. And some people have interpreted that. But a lot of people throughout the centuries have looked at this as, can you imagine the spiritual growth, the, dis the discipling that went on in his soul as he was just quiet? He couldn't talk. And we see when he finally does talk, I mean, man, this beautiful poetry comes out filled with words about God's plan and his belief and his faith, has, you can see, has exploded as he's grown over those nine months in silence. So God wasn't there just going, all right, I'm just going to punish you because you didn't believe. No, I want to disciple you. I want to take that struggle you're having and build into you so that that, that comes out and you grow. One writer says, though there will be times when we disobey, there is forgiveness as we repent and return to the Lord. This process of discipleship, or sanctification it's called, which restores the image of God in us, takes a lifetime and is completed only in the world to come. But we can make great progress in this world, which should be our highest priority even though we're still in the process always of change, doesn't mean we can't be effective and grow, and we want to do that. And as I think about that process of discipleship, you know, this, I read this on a site called, you know, the C.S. Lewis Institute, and the writer was Thomas Terrence, and I'm like, why, why does that name sound familiar? And I remember I had read a book that he was mentioned in quite a bit in, in that book, and then I looked him up, and he also has his own book, called Consumed by Hate, Redeemed by Love. And Thomas Terrence was a guy back in the 60s who was a hardcore racist. He was part of the Ku Klux Klan. He was into the violence. He was into all that stuff. And he ended up in prison. And in prison, he, he met Jesus Christ. And it changed him. And he was discipled. And he got in touch with the plan of what righteousness means. And he found out that, wow, everyone is valuable in the sight of God, no matter what ethnicity, no matter what skin color, no matter what, they're all valuable in the sight of God. And now he holds a ministry for racial reconciliation. Why? Because he got on the plan, the good plan, the reliable plan, the righteous plan, and he was discipled. And that's where discipleship takes us.
So as we come to a close, will we commit to following God's plan? Will we commit when we feel afraid and we need to get back to what the plan really is, that he works through his church, he works through his Holy Spirit, that his scriptures are reliable? Will we get back to knowing, hey, what righteousness looks like? It's a righteous plan, and I want to live that out in a godly way and just be able to cooperate and connect with that idea of being discipled. Will you pray with me? Father God, I'm just so grateful. Just so grateful for your plan. And I pray that in the times when fear comes in, we're wondering what's going on with your plan or whatever, that the words that uh, the angel spoke would come back, that your word would come back to us and bring us back on track. That, Lord, when we're acting out in the world and we're doing what's right, that we remember we do that only through love and compassion, not just for ourselves, but for other people, and that we can truly live out your righteousness, and that we will be able to cooperate when you are disciplining us, discipling us, that it's for our good and for us to get closer to you. And let that reminder just keep on reminding us, not just today, but all the way out day after day through the Christmas season and into next year. And we thank you and we ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Oh, may the Lord bless you, keep you, and his face shine upon you and give you his peace. Have a great day. God bless you.